I invite you to join me and open your Bibles to 2 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 2 and in in following, you know, all the way up into chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at disunity. And instead of just hoping that you get that concept intellectually, I wanted you to feel it. And so here it goes. I remember the night that my dad invited me and my two little brothers to my grandma's house and he introduced us to our quote-unquote new mom. And through tears and clenched fists, as the oldest brother, I told my dad, I already have a mom and so do they. We don't need her. And so that night was the culmination of a lot of broken promises and disunity. And ultimately, it broke what was supposed to be unbroken, that is, a marriage, a family. It was by far my worst, ba- my worst best day ever as a 12-year-old. One of the greatest pains that you can ever experience or cause someone else to experience in your life is the open wound called disunity, broken marriages, families, nations, even churches. All of them are relationships founded and approved by God, and when those relationships are attacked and their defenses are breached, the sorrow felt has no equal other than perhaps death itself. The reason this message is so relevant for you this morning is due to the fact that you live in a fragmented world. Divorce is commonplace. All of us, if we were to raise our hands, almost all of us, we've been affected by it. Either we have been divorced or we're their children of divorce. So we know what this disunity looks like and more importantly, feels like. Our nation is deeply divided along racial, political, and religious lines. Our church is the very body of Christ, often finds itself disjointed, choosing to fight amongst ourselves instead of our mutual spiritual enemies. Jesus once said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And the veracity, the truthfulness of that scripture is all around us. So now that I've got your attention, hopefully, this morning we're going to be looking at portions of 2 Samuel, forgive me, chapters 2 through 5, and here we're going to find a brokenness of a different nature, but with a shared pain. The last Lord's Day, we saw the example of David and how he was enabled to love his enemies. He, he loved Saul despite everything Saul tried to do to him. He loved his brother in arms, Jonathan, and with their passing, there should have been no question, no reason for Israel to remain fragmented and, as a result, vulnerable to their enemies. They all should have rallied around their new king. But as we're going to see, there are times when men would rather choose their own wills instead of God's. And so this morning, we're going to answer three questions concerning disunity. What causes it? What are its consequences? And lastly, what is the cure? And my hope here is to enable you to not only avoid those things that would cause division in those God-ordained relationships we've just mentioned, but when brokenness and division does happen in your marriage, in your family, in your church, you'll know how to see it restored. And so let's get started as we answer these three questions concerning disunity. Here's the first question, what causes Disunity, And let's set the context. Saul and Jonathan are dead. This is what we looked at in the first chapter of uh, 2 Samuel. Their bodies have been returned to Israel. They've been properly buried. And now there is a void of leadership that sends a few opportunists scrambling for positions. And so now we read 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Read there with me. Notice what it says. But Abner, the son of Ner, commander of Saul's armies, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to uh, Mahanaim. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. And he made him king over Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel and Ephraim and Benjamin and all of Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned for two years, but the house of Judah followed David. 
And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So then, Israel, God's people, are divided. And the battle lines are now drawn, not against the Philistines, not against their true enemy, but one another. This is God's house divided. So then, what was the primary cause of their division? The answer, of course, is sin. But in this instance, it's a very specific type of sin that Abner and Ishbosheth have committed. It's the, the sin of rejecting God's revealed will. So this begs the question, what was God's will in regards to the next king of the nation of Israel? Well, the Lord had made it perfectly clear years before. And we see this all the way back in 1 Samuel 15, verse 26. Notice what it says there. And again, Saul had failed to obey the Lord in annihilating the Amalekites. We've revisited this over and over again as we've gone through the life of David. But it's because it's a turning point. It's where we see the disobedience of the anointed king, Saul, and then there's consequences. And that's what we see here again. God sends the prophet Samuel to him. And he reveals his will to King Saul. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. He had begged him, please, for appearance's sake, come back with me in front of the elders and all the people so that it looks like we're united, even though we're not. And he's like, I'm not going with you. I will not return with you. Why? For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Make sure that that resonates with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord. You have a word in front of you as well. God's word. And when you look at that and you see God's revealed will for your life, not some ambiguous kind of thing. You know, we always want to treat God's, you know, the the Bible as a magic eight ball and ask silly questions of it and hope that we get answers. No, it's real basic stuff about right and wrong. What's good for you, what's not good for you. And when you look at it and you go, Meh, whatever. It's an old book, antiquated, not relevant, and God knows my real heart. And so I'm going to reject this just out of hand because it doesn't really suit me. It doesn't please me, and I'm going to pretend that we're okay with God. That's what Saul was hoping for. Yeah, so I didn't do exactly what God said. I did most of it, but let's pretend that I'm okay with God. You come marching in with me, Samuel the prophet, And so everybody thinks that me and God are good still. That's how most of us, myself included, are living the Christian life today. Eh. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. So we have a word. We have God's revealed will in front of us as well. God rejected him because he had rejected the word. And that's pretty cut and dry. So God's will concerning the king of Israel, what was it? Step one, Saul, you're no longer the king. Step two of God's will was revealed in 1 Samuel 16 and later on in verse 13. Check out what it says, 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. In other words, I've got somebody else that's ready. Don't even worry about it, Samuel. I've got a guy. I know this guy. So we see God's will very clearly now explained in verse 13. Notice what it says there. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, meaning David, in the midst of his brothers. They had marched everybody else out. He's the littlest one. They didn't even bring him out from the fields. He was watching the sheep like, yeah, I'm going to put all of, you know, my big boys out here, surely the midget, not him, right? And so they didn't bring him in. That was the guy. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David, this young man, from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This was the will of God. David is the new king, anointed by God. Everyone knew it, especially by this time, Abner and Ishbosheth. And despite this knowledge, Abner and Ishbosheth chose their will over God's will. In other words, they sinned. Now here's the question, why did they do it? 
Well, run, one, for Abner, he was the commander of Saul's army. He didn't want to lose that. He feared like, okay, if I side with David, I've been the enemy. I've been in pursuit of him all this time. He's going to, one, maybe just demote me and I'm going to be sergeant of a bunch of you know, losers or even worse, straight up kill me. And so I'm going to retain my power. I'm still in command here. And if I put this guy, Ishbosheth, in power, he'll still be the king. And this was, again, this was Saul's son. You, I kind of initially, I thought, I thought all of son, Saul's sons died on Gilead, on Mount Gilead with Jonathan and Saul and others. And no, they probably put this guy somewhere safe just for this scenario. If all else fails, still have a son of Saul on the throne, Ish- Ishbosheth. And so this is why Ishbosheth, he knew, he knew what Samuel had done all those years before. He knew that David was supposed to be the new king, but he allowed for it because he was thinking, man, I don't want to end up like my dad, like Jonathan, and just be dead because that's what's going to happen to me. And so he chose his life. He chose his Will, Abner chose power, prestige, his life. He chose his will over and above God's will. They sinned. Look at what it says, 2 Samuel chapter 2, 8 and 9. But Abner and the son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and he brought him over to Mahanaim, and he made him king over Gilead and the Asherites and Jezreel and Ephraim and Benjamin and all of Israel. Why? Because their will superseded God's. They sinned. Now, you would never do this, right? You would never knowingly and willingly sin against God. When you sin, it's sheer accident. Like, man, I can't believe I did that. That just came out, you know, like a knee-jerk reaction. Smash your hand, you say that word. Every sin we commit, right, we want to pretend it's something that is reactionary or an accident or somebody has to bring it to our attention. Oh, did I? Okay. And then we'll fess up. Now, we do this kind of thing all the time. Knowingly, willingly, stepping into sin, just like they did. Choosing our will, our desires above our Father's. Look with me for a moment at Exodus chapter 20. These are just some examples. Verses 12 through 17. These these statements right here, they're not all of the Ten Commandments, obviously, right? But just these ones. And, And notice what is key here. It's all about relationships. Honor who? Mom and dad. The way you relate to them is important to God. And so he has a will for your life in regards to how you relate to them. You shall not murder. Why? Because even if they're your enemies, there's something about the way you relate to them that is important to God, and he has something to say about that. He has a will for that. You shall not commit adultery. My goodness, marriage is an intimate relationship, and so he has something to say about that. You shall not steal. From whom? From people. And you relate to them. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet. All of these things are relational. God has a will for the way you relate to the world around you. And when you mess that up, when you sin and you choose your will over God's, guess what? You bring division, disunity. You break what is supposed to be unbroken. And read there again, verse 17 with me. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. That word covet, kamad in the Hebrew, means more than to simply want something or someone. It also carries with it the motive behind your desire, your wanting. You see, it also implies the act of taking great pleasure in something or someone that is forbidden to you. Abner and Ishbosheth set their hearts on the power and the protection provided by the crown of Israel. They desired what was forbidden to them as revealed by the prophet of God, therefore the word of God, because God's will was perfectly clear. David was supposed to be the next king of Israel. Make no mistake, the cause of your brokenness 
that you have experienced, that you are experiencing even now, can be traced back to one thing, sin. You or somebody in proximity to you chose their will, you chose your will above God's revealed will in Scripture. You looked at those Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. I've never murdered anybody, but I hate that dude. And we find in the New Testament, say, hey man, if you hate somebody, you've murdered them in your heart. And you're good with it. I'm going to choose my will over God's will. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You all know what that means. Don't pretend like you're an eighth grader at the school that was up here one time. He told me, he's like, I can't commit adultery because I'm not married yet. Hey, haven't you ever heard what Jesus said? Hey, if you lust after someone, you've committed adultery already. And so we do this all the time. We choose our will over God's will because it's pragmatic, it's pleasurable, it's, it gives us something that we need and then we justify it in some manner like we're still good, right God? And we want the, the man of God, we want God somehow to march out with us in front of everybody in our sin and pretend everything's okay and it's really not. These two men desired what was forbidden to them. They coveted what God had clearly said was not theirs. And this is what we do as well. All of our brokenness, all of the disunity, the broken relationships in your home, in your family, in your church, in your place of work, at school, all of that brokenness is probably because you chose your will over God's. And now you know. Those divisions in your marriage, your family, our nation, and even in our church, not just the church, our church, Grace Hill Church, has one root cause, the sin of putting our will above and before God's will as seen in His Word. And it's real important for us to ground it there, right? Because when I just say, when I just throw it out there, you know, God's will, we are real quick to fill in the blank, right? What's God's will for your life? And you're going to say some crazy stuff that, found, you know, no foundation in Scripture, but you're going to base it on some weird feeling that you got because, you know, God wants me to be happy. That must be His will for my life. Therefore, this illicit relationship, this breaking of my vows, this whatever it is that it is stealing, whatever it is, is good for me and is blessed by God because his greatest will for me is to be happy and this makes me happy, blah, blah, blah. No. It is not God's will according to your brain. That's a God of your imagination. It's always God's will as revealed in his scripture. That's where you can find his will, not here. Now then, secondly, what are the consequences of disunity? We already know its source, it's, it's us. Disunity happens when we sin, when we willingly choose our will over God's. Now then, what are the consequences? Well, if we look at what Scripture tells us, and back in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel, we discover the consequences, or rather chapter 2, verses 12 through 28. And by the way, this goes south really quick, which is exactly what sin tends to do to our relationships. 2 Samuel 2, verse 12 and following. Look at what it says. Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ifbosheth, Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim and to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zariah, and the servants of David, went out and met them at the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down. These are two opposing forces, yeah? Saul's old army now under Ishbosheth and the commander of David's army, Joab, yeah? And Joab, the son of Zariah, and the servants of David went out and they met with them at the pool of Gibeon. They sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men arise and compete before us. And Joab said, well, let them arise. Now, when I saw the word compete, you know, I was thinking they're going to, I don't know, have a goat tossing contest, uh, slings maybe involved, whatever Jews in ancient times did to compete. That's not what they did at all. 
Look at what it says in verse 15. Then they arose and passed over by number, twelve from Benjamin and Ishbosheth, and the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And so they chose teams. And I'm sure it wasn't like, you know, yeah, well, I'll take the scrawny dude over here. No, these were all the, the studs on the team, right? Best against the best. And each caught his opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side, so they fell down together. Man, that's not goat tossing. I mean, they, these guys are straight up killing one another. This is like a gladiator game. Therefore, the place was called Helka Hazarum, which is at Gibeon. And so a full-scale battle ensues, and Team David is taking it to Team Abner Ishbosheth. So much so that Abner's men scatter, and Abner finds himself isolated and running for his life. And he's being run down by, evidently, the track star of Team David, Joab's brother, Asahel. And Abner tells him in verse 21 and following, he tells, he warns him several times. Look at what it says. Abner said to him, turn aside to your right hand or to your left. Seize one of the young men and take his spoil. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then could I lift up my face to your brother Joab? But he refused to turn aside. Therefore Abner, and check this out, this is rough. There's a reason he was the commander of Saul's army. I mean, he was about it. Abner struck him in the stomach with the butt of the spear so that the spear came out of his back. And he fell there and died where he was. And all who came to the place where Asahel had fallen and died stood still in amazement at what had just transpired. And what happens next is that this now just turns into a, into a bloody mess. Turns into like an ancient version of the Hatfields and McCoys. You know, just this honor-based society. You know, you killed one of mine, I'm going to kill 10 of yours. You killed 10 of mine, I'm going to kill 100 of yours. And so the onslaught ensues. Verse 24 and following. But Joab and Abishai pursued Abner. These are the brothers of the young man that was just killed. And as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amma, which lies before Gia on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And the people of Benjamin gathered themselves together behind Abner and became one group. And they took their stand on the top of the hill. And then, it's, it's a strange thing, Abner seemingly comes to his senses and he calls out to Joab, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you tell your people to turn from the pursuit, and get this, of their brothers? There it is. Do you see what he said there again at the end? This is not a battle between sworn enemies. This isn't even a civil war in the sense of citizens fighting one another. This is a family torn apart. The family of God devouring itself from the inside out, spilling the blood of their brothers. You see, the sin of self-will, of ignoring or rebelling against God's will as seen in His Word, it inevitably has this kind of effect, this collateral damage, if you will. Think about it holistically. Let's get the big picture, the big biblical picture of sin and its effects, starting with Lucifer. And we see this implied in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Notice what is said there. How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, and notice five times this is repeated, I will. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High, like God Himself. I will, I will, I will. What happened as a result of Lucifer, Lucifer's will? You all know the account. He fell, ended up assuming the form of a serpent, and eventually he slithered up to a young lady who was standing next to a tree in a garden. And then we know what happened. Genesis chapter 3. 
verses 1 through 6. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You'll you'll not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil, in other words, you'll get to decide what's right and wrong for yourself. I will. I will. I will. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, in other words, to become your own little God, choosing what's right and wrong for yourself, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And of course, Adam and Eve, they hide from God. They hide in the bushes. They sow some fig leaves to cover themselves with. You know, they're so small, they wouldn't have been proper in front of Sports Illustrated kind of thing. You know, but they're doing their best to hide their shame from God because now there's a division between them and their father. Why? I will. I will. I will decide what's right and wrong for me. Who cares about the consequences? And now where there was love and fellowship, father, son, and daughter in the garden, everything provided, and there was this intimate, deep relationship, now there's a hiding in the bushes with fig leaves tied around their waist. Of course, it didn't end there. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, meaning Adam, what we just read in Genesis chapter 3, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Death. Spiritually dead. We are not born into this world neutral. We are not born into this world innocent. Because of our first parents' sin, we all sin. And therefore, according to David in Psalm 51, we were born in iniquity. We were born with this sin nature. And this is why you know this by raising your own children. This is why you have to teach, beg, and even sometimes get rough with Johnny so he will not steal. He won't slap his siblings around. He will not sin. Because why? Because it's in him. Because of that day, there's been division. There's still division between ourselves and God and everything and every, everyone else around us. Why? Because I will, I will, I will. In eternity past, Lucifer chose his will over God's. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve chose their will over God's. When Saul died and David should have been acknowledged by all of Israel as the rightful anointed king, Abner and Ishbosheth chose their will over God's. And now every time you sin with your eyes wide open, you are choosing your will above God's known will, and the effects always touch the lives around you. We make the mistake, and this is how we rationalize our sin. It's just me. I'm not affecting anybody else. This just hurts me. I'll own it. I'll repent of it later. You know, I've got to repent of something. Might as well be this, right? And so, but it's not affecting anybody else. And so we make the mistake of thinking that sin is like a bullet fired from a sniper's rifle. One shot, one target, me. I'll take the shot. That's not the biblical picture we see at all. Sin is far more like a hand grenade. Not only does it obliterate the intended target, it also maims and kills everyone within 100 feet or so. That's it. And look, we could go on and on about how this just continues. In chapter 3, we find Abner turning on his patron, Ishbosheth, or how Joab finally catches up with Abner and murders him. I could relate to you the account of Ishbosheth and how he was eventually assassinated by his own people in the most horrific manner. I mean, it's something right out of the Godfather. Ralph Emerson once wrote, The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken in heaps is because man is disunited with himself. 
I dare correct Mr. Emerson by changing one word in that otherwise poetic little phrase. The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken in heaps is because man is disunited with God. That's it. James 4, verses 1 and 2. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Why is there disunity? Is it not that your passions, is it, is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? In other words, you want this, you want that. You want your will, your will, your will. You desire, you do not have, so you murder. You covet, you want something that is forbidden to you. And you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. These are the consequences of your sin. Your will instead of God's. A family, a nation, a church divided by murderous hate. Again, we see this, you see this in your homes. When you're talking to your wife, your kids. You see this at school, talking amongst your friends. You see this in your workplace. We see this in the church. And that's where I want to land here, just for a moment, as a point of application. Allow me just to address us as the people of God, as Grace Hill Church. I've been pastor of Grace Hill in what was once Crestview for over 12 years now. And I dare say that during seven of those years, when it was Crestview, this church was at constant war with itself. Very little moments of reprieve. I quickly discovered that every decision was going to be met with opposition. Let's open the parking lot up on 4th of July, invite the public, invite people to come up here. We'll share some cheap hot dogs, some chips, and share the gospel. Maybe God, in His grace, will save a few, will watch the fireworks. No, we ain't doing that. Why? Because my, my tithe pays for me to watch the fireworks from up here on the hill, not somebody that doesn't come here. Or if they come up, they might get hurt. They could roll off the hill, break a leg, and now they own the church, you know, and they're going to turn it into a used car lot. Who knows? There was always something. No. I once had a dude tell me that I look like a Tijuana taxi cab driver. And as a result, I can't invite my friends here to hear a man like you preach from that pulpit. Looks like you. I'm thinking, dude, you're the one that called me here. I mean, I know I'd been living in Missouri. I was a little pale, but I'm browner now. Yeah, I get it, but good night. This is me, been me for all these years. That really happened. I had some folks tell me one time because there was going to have to be church discipline done in the church. We had taken the proper steps. We had Matthew 18 it up. I talked to the individual. I had taken a deacon with me. We had talked to the individual. And finally, was we going to have to do it, you know, out in the open in front of the whole church, reluctantly, with the heart for repentance. And I was told no. And I told him, I have to. Not because you, you know, your approval or not, because scripture says so. And so just before that meeting, I was escorted into a little room back there and these fellas tell me, it's like, oh, hey, before you go out there and you make a fool of yourself, uh, can I ask you one question, Pastor? Sure. What's the question? How are you going to feed your family? You know, it's way out of context. What do you mean? How am I going to feed? Oh, I get it. That was a threat. You're going to stop giving. He's like, absolutely. You go do this. We're going to stop giving. Everybody's going to stop giving. We're going to starve you out. How are you going to feed those four precious boys? How are you going to feed Stephanie? How are you going to be the man of your house when you can't even feed your family? And I started laughing, and I told him, um, look, man, I, I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't raised with a silver spoon in my mouth, raised in Bloomfield in a trailer park. My family, we just came from seminary, nine years of living off of beans and tortillas and potatoes, 
and dirt poor. And so, look, if you guys stop giving, that's fine. I'm going to stand on God's word, and, and we're going to go for it. And if I have to go flip hamburgers, dig ditches, drive a taxi cab in Tijuana, whatever it is I got to do, I'm going to do that, and we're going to be good. And, and we did. That's the kind of disunity that I've experienced. Some of you probably have not. I hope you never do. But let me just make this point. Although I believe Grace Hill is essentially healthy, we are always one sin away from absolute disunity. From the pastor, from you, from one of the other pastors, it's, we're always one sin, one person saying, I'm going to choose my will above your revealed will as we see in Scripture, God, and I don't care what happens. Always one sin away. Your marriage, your family, your church. Always one sin away from complete anarchy and division. So then, what is the cure? The cure for disunity. In Israel's case, it's seen in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. Abner and Ishbosheth have both needlessly suffered horrible ends at the hands of their own people, the people of God. And finally, God's irresistible and sovereign will comes about. Look at what is said in verse 1 there. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are bone, your bone and flesh. In other words, we're, we're brothers, we're family. That was the first realization. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord said to you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. In other words, you're going to be the king. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed king David king over Israel. So then, what caused Israel finally to come to terms with David being their king? It's right there in verse 2. The Lord said, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You shall be prince over Israel. In other words, the Lord had said it, and by His sovereign will, He brought it about. You see, the cure for the disunity in your life is found in in you submitting, not to your will, giving in to your desires, but rather submitting to the sovereign, revealed will of God as found in Scripture. Not in your imagination, not in your justification of your sin, not in your rationalizing your sin and hoping that since it makes you happy, this will make God happy and you get to pretend that you're on good terms with Him. No, according to His revealed will. Sovereign will. So this is the cure. Submit to God's word. Let me give you three good reasons why you should submit to God's will found in his word today. One, his will is unchangeable. God is going to get his way regardless of what you want, regardless of how you twist his truth to make it suit your context, your circumstances, your sin, his will is going to prevail no matter what. Several verses that kind of point to this. Psalm 15, verse 3, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. It's good to be the king, yeah? Right. As Mel Brooks would say, and that's exactly what is being said here. He gets to do what He wants. Psalm 103, verse 19, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens. And his sovereignty rules over all. A sovereign Lord, a sovereign king has absolute authority and power to enact that authority over his subjects. And that's what's being said there. Daniel, verse 4, 35. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? In other words, his will will always come to pass. And so when you read those verses that are contrary to what you want, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah, but man, that feels good. 
Thou shalt not steal, but yeah, I'm in a really tough spot. I, I need that extra income. And just tweaking it a little bit, we justify it. God knows my real heart. Thou shalt honor your mom and your dad. Yeah, but it, I have this against them. You see what I'm talking about? His will will always prevail. Second reason why you should submit to his will as revealed in his word is uh, his will for you is always good. There's a distinction between feeling good in your current circumstances, whatever that sin is. By the way, that's why we give in to temptation all the time. You know, we, we talk about it real negatively. Oh man, I have this horrible sin. But well, why do you do it? Well, let's be honest. It does something that we like. God's will is always better. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This doesn't mean you'll never suffer or experience hardship in your life, but it does mean that God's will, his ultimate purpose for your ultimate good will prevail in the end. There is suffering this side of eternity. And some of it is God-ordained. He allows it. Read the book of Job. The beginning of it, he's this godly man. Horrible things happen to him. He loses his family, his wealth, his mind, his wife, everything. All of his friends abandon him. Everything's gone at the end of it. Through his trials, through his suffering, he knows God more intimately than he ever did before. Everything you're going through in your life right now, God will bring about for your good. His will is good. Three, it was God's will to save you. This is another reason why you should submit to his will. Because he's the one that saved you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even, and get this, as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundation of the world. Make sure you get that picture in your mind. He chose you in your sins before you were even thought of, before the, founda- before the world was even spoken into existence. God, being God, chose you. Have you ever read that in Scripture? Because I know where you're thinking. When you think in terms of salvation, you're just thinking about your participation heard the gospel, and I was smart enough, and yeah, good, I was good enough, and I responded to it, and I prayed the prayer, and now I'm going to heaven. This is God's perspective. Before I even spoke the world into existence, I chose you. Read it again. Even as he chose us in him when, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, so he... He chose us who were sinners, we weren't even thought of, weren't even created, to be in Him, to be holy, to be in relationship with Him. And then notice what it says in verse 5. In love, He predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. Again, that word meaning to choose us. According to what? According to Him responding to your will? I prayed a prayer and so I'm going to respond and now it's my will to save you? No. Why did he choose you before the foundation of the world? Why did he predestine to adopt you and make you his own? Look at what it says at the end of verse 5. According to the purpose of his will. Wow. This is why you should submit to God's will. Because it was God's sovereign grace, God's sovereign will that saved you in the first place. And yes, indeed, you responded. You went, oh, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I'm broken before you, Father. I repent of my sins and I'm trusting in Jesus Christ today. You did that. He enabled you to do that. His will allowed that for, to transpire. So you see now the cure for what divides us is found when you abandon your sinful will and embrace God's revealed will. So here's what we've learned. The cause of disunity, the sin of choosing your will over God's. The consequences, broken relationships with God and everybody else around you. The cure, you submit to the will of God today. 
Some of you are living right now outside of the will of God. You know it because even now you're feeling the weightiness of doing that. And I hope perhaps that some of that weightiness is right now some of you are feeling deep conviction. Not just guilt and shame that drives you out into the bushes to hide from God, but the kind of conviction that burdens you to where you have to find relief, not just cover it up. You need and you desire relief finally. And so you come running to God. You know that it's time for you to get right with God, to abandon your will and to trust in His will for your life. And so this is what you need to do. For some of you, you need to just absolutely look to Christ and be saved today because you're not. You need to know that He was fully God and fully man that he lived a life that was in absolute submission to the will of his Father, a perfect, obedient life. He was, sinned in a, he was tempted in every way, but he never sinned. And therefore, he could be your substitute as well. He took your sins that you have committed. He went to the cross. He said, these belong to me. And his Father, he disciplined him. He allowed him to die on the cross for your sins. He took the punishment so that you could have forgiveness. Three days later, he rose again so that you can have eternal life. And those gifts can be yours this morning and you can be in the will of God if you will repent of your sins, primarily your sin of self-will, and you can trust in Jesus Christ as I've just explained to him, as he's revealed in the word. You can be saved. For other of, others of you here who are Christians, who can and do and will choose your own will above God's, probably today, you need to repent. You're living in sin, known sin. Stop playing games with God's word. Stop ignoring the conviction that's in your heart. Be broken, and yes, it may mean you're going to have to stop doing whatever it is that contributes to your life right now. Be it some relationship, be it some money that's illicit, or whatever else it is, some hate issues you've got in your heart, you're going to have to let that go and trust God and His will. Trust that it's good today. You know, my family never truly healed. My folks divorced a few years later after that one night. Life was never the same until seven years later. That was the night that God in His sovereign will chose to save me. And from that day forward, I was reconciled. I had a relationship with my Father, my Heavenly Father, and my earthly Father, and my family. I discovered a whole new family that I was united to, a church, Church, I would have never gone and hung out with those dudes before, but now we had Christ. Now we had a Father mutual. We had unity. You can have that. Some of you are so lonely and you're so broken. Your families, your marriages, even your relationships here at church, broken. God came to reconcile those. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of of knowing that your will has and will continue to prevail. And I trust this morning that it's your will to save some here this morning and that they understand that now before the foundation of the world that you had chosen them, you predestined them and that what they need to do now is be broken before you and be saved and so I pray Lord as we take this moment that some people here will do just that and be saved others here that are living in, in sin and they know it Father help them to trust your will it's inevitable there are severe consequences that will affect not only themselves but those around them, if they continue on disobeying your will, help them to repent of that and trust that your will is good. That you're going to save them out of that sin. So Father, we thank you for these lessons that we've learned in the life of David and Israel here. 
May your blessings rest upon us now in Jesus' name. Amen.